this subject you can take a long time on. It can be a series because there's not one approach to when you get hurt by a church or when you get hurt by a person, there is not just one rule. There is all kinds of, it depends on the situation. It depends on all kinds of things, how you react to it. What I would like to do this morning is to, to paint a picture of all the different reactions and all the things that, that are, are right. And to give context to this problem, because this problem is promised to us in the Bible. It's promised that we're going to have problems even in the church. And so if we know the context, it prepares us to face it. It prepares us to face up with the problems that we're going we're gonna to have. And I do believe that we tend to have one specific understanding of how we should deal with things. And, and I, I think we don't look at the other side enough. And so we're going to be running through verses really fast. This is not the time where we're going to be looking into detail. This is a time where we're taking a big context saying, look, this is what could happen. And this is how the Bible says you can react this way or you can react this way. And I hope in the end that we get freedom from this. That we, we understand the freedom that God has given us by his blood. And, and that we can be set free from these situations where we are hurt. First of all, why, why would we be hurt? <laughs> why does this happen in the body of Christ? Well, first of all, we're sinners. I'm a sinner. I can hurt others and I can be hurt because of myself. I, I've lived in many cultures and I, I've, I've come to understand that there is so much context behind the problems that we face and the way we, we understand each other and we can hurt each other without even knowing it because we, we see this world through a bunch of glasses. We, we have a set of glasses. We have cultural glasses. We have glasses from our experience. So you've experienced things in your life and it makes you understand this world in a different way than, than my experiences. We have that, and then we have our emotions. You know, at the time that we're living right now, you may be on a really emotional high because let's say your, your, your child just got married and you're just joyful. Or let's say you just lost someone. And, and so you have this other set of glasses and you understand everything that's happening around you through them. And so you react differently. And then you have different relationships with different people. And then your health also affects the way you deal with things. If I'm not healthy, I may not have patience with my children as much as if I am healthy. <laughs> so there's all these things that affect the way we understand and view the world. And so, yes, there's sin in our lives. That's one layer of problems that I, I, I don't think I have to say much about it. We know we're sinners, right? But there's also just our perspectives where we can hurt each other without even knowing it because we understand this world differently. And just a, a small example of that is, is let's say that someone's dog bit a child outside. And so you see what happened there. And there can be all kinds of reactions to how and why that happened. So my wife grew up in a culture in Nepal where dogs are not friends. You see, here in the West, this go dogs are our best friends. They're, they're good. They protect us. They're nice. In Nepal, you kick dogs when you see them. You throw a stone at them. You swirl them around with their tails. You know, they're, they're, they're dirty. They're despicable. So all of a sudden, you see the truth. You see this child being bit by the dog. Well, in the Nepali's mind, it's the dog's fault no matter what. No matter what happens. But then if you come from a Western point of view, where I grew up with a big Newfoundland that protected me when I was young and ran around the mountains with me, he was my friend. He was protective. And I'm like, man, that kid did something wrong there. But that dog is right. <laughs> you know? And so you have this perspective of truth that's already warped by your culture, by your experiences. My wife was bit three times by dogs. And like I said, my dog protected me. And so you have their experience that you're carrying into things. And so you have all these layers behind us, all these hurts 
from the past that you're carrying with you. The other day when we were fishing, a few months ago, not the other day, when I was fishing, I caught this big fish, you know, and I, I grabbed the hold of the line and it just pulled it and it just cut, cut my finger. From that day for a few weeks, everything I did hurt me. You know, you know how you get a wound and you're always hitting it? You get a wound on your knee and you're constantly hitting it, it seems. Well, you're really not hitting it more than any other time. It's just that you're hurt there. And so we have emotional and, and painful experiences in our lives that we're, we're wounded in one place. And when someone says something to us that really is nothing, really, it's, not, it's no big deal, it hurts us. And we're like, oh, man, that was mean. Why did they say that to me? Why did they do that to me? And we get frustrated with that person and we get angry with that person. So there is so much hurt that happens that really was not meant to hurt, hurt anything. It's just who we are as people culturally and with our experiences and just our different ways of seeing this world. And so there's that type of thing that we run into in, in the church. But obviously there's, there's sin as well. There's different points of view as well. Um, for example, Paul and Barnabas had different points of view. I thank God for, for putting that story in there. That saying that, hey, you, you don't always see the same, things the same way. And there's some pretty important things that are different in each church. And sometimes we can hurt each other by attacking about those, those differences. And then uh, Paul and Barnabas, you see, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with him. And Paul, was, Paul said, no, he's not trustworthy. <laughs> we shouldn't be taking them. And so they split ways. The Bible doesn't tell us who was right. Later on, we know that Paul says he, he asks John Mark to be sent to him. So there was eventually some, some unity there. But at that point, separation was for the sake of unity. And there's some issues in the church that that, that needs to happen. There needs to be separation for the sake of unity. Look, we're, we're not going to see eye to eye on these things. So we better just be separate. And, and one of the biggest Issues, I would say, is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's a good example uh, where people have different views about them. And it's like, okay, let's, let's just, you know, do it your way. I'll do it my way. So there's those type of things. We tend to attack one another on these things. And sometimes there is a reason to, and sometimes there isn't. We'll get to what we need to do when there is problems and when there is hurt. But these are some of the problems. There's sin. There's perspective. It's not sin, but it's just we've been hurt in life. And so because of that hurt, other people hurt us again. And so we react to each other just because we're different. But here's a very important one. The church is filled with false teachers and false Christians, and this is something that is repeated over and over and over again, everywhere in the New Testament, and this cannot be overlooked. It cannot be overlooked that there are wolves in sheep's clothing that are after you and that will hurt you, <laughs> especially if you stand up to them, especially if you are not willing to, to bow to them. And this is something that, that as, as, like I said, it's everywhere in the Bible. Matthew 24, verse 3 to 5, it says, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered, watch out. Okay, warning first. What's the end going to be like? Whoa, be careful. Be careful, watch out, that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. And you can continue on reading there in Matthew 24. He repeats this three times that many false prophets will come and deceive many and many will turn away from the faith. So this is not a small problem. This is the very first thing that Jesus says to us. Listen up. When you get to closer to the end of the, of the days, 
there is going to be many false teachers. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. You see, that's a promise. Just as there were false prophets in the Old Testament, there will be among you, it's, he says here, the Apostle Peter. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destructions on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. There's a lot of hurt when people exploit us greedily, right? Notice here again the word many, but there will be false teachers. If there is false teachers in the church, we can expect to be hurt by the church. And so we need to prepare ourselves for that. We need to prepare ourselves and say, hey, wait a minute. The church isn't going to be a perfect place. And so I'll, I'll tell you later on how we can prepare for this even better. I'll get to that later, but I want to show you here in verse 2. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Who is bringing the way of truth into disrepute? It's the false teacher. It's not the person separating himself from the false teacher. But you know what the false teachers will do? They said, you brought division because you left my church. <laughs> no, no, no. Whoever's dealing falsely, he's the one bringing disrepute to the church, according to these words. And that disrepute is not our fault if we choose to decide to separate from false teaching. This is probably the, the, the biggest... Um, the most important, let's say, verses on false teaching of the Bible is Acts chapter 20, verse 27 to 32. Acts chapter 20, verse 27 to 32. The reason why this is very important is we understand through these verses that the Apostle Paul spoke about false teachers among us all the time. All the time. When he first started the church, this is one of his major topics that he approached the church with. And I don't think we speak about enough about it. Listen to what he says, Acts 20, verse 27 to 32. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come among you and will not spare the flock. So he knows this will happen. Even from your own number, so arising from within you, you know for a long time I thought false teaching was outside of my churches. <laughs> you know, I'm not, you know, that's the Mormons, you know. No, 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 no. From among yourselves, they will ar arise from among you, they will distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. So be on your guard and remember that for three years I have never, I have not stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Is that important or what? He was crying and saying, be careful. This is going to happen. So this is something that we cannot overlook when we're talking about why are we hurt from the church? What should we do when we're hurt from the church and from other Christians one major thing is, well, wait a minute, are they false? Are, are they false teachers? Are they deceiving me? Is that one reason? That's, that's one thing that we should look at. I want to go through a bunch um, of verses right now really, really fast to show you two sets of directions because I think we tend to think, just, just bear with it. And be gracious. Just bear with it, you know. We all have problems. There's sin, you know. I'll just, I'll just be quiet, and I'll bear with this problem, and I'll, I'll forgive, you know. I'll be good. So there's this type of list of, of, of verses that come really easily to us. So Luke six twenty seven, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Okay, so maybe I shouldn't talk. I shouldn't speak about 
the hurt that I have. Because I have to love my enemies, right? Luke 6, 28, bless those who curse you and mistreat you. So, yeah, so I should pray for the person who, who, who hurts me. And I'm not saying this is wrong. These are right things, but there are other verses, and, and they'll come in a minute. Luke 6, 29, if someone slaps you, turn the other cheek. Matthew 18, 22, forgive 70 times 7. 1 Corinthians 6, 7, why not rather be wronged or cheated than to bring your brother to court? Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers. Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. And by the way, Hebrews 13, 7, obey your leaders and submit to them. That's a very dangerous verse if you don't read the rest of the Bible. And I'll read you all kinds of verses that tell you the uh, other ways to deal with leaders when they're hurting you and what you should do. Ephesians 4.32, be kind one to another, forgiving each other. Ephesians 4.1, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. 1 Corinthians 1.10, all of you agree with one another and have no division among you. Be perfectly united in mind and thought. So all these things seem to say, you've been wronged, you've been hurt, you just put up with it. Pray, bless, don't say anything. It seems to say, but that, that's just taken out of context, and it's not taken into context all these other commands that we have in the Bible. And, and let me read you all these other commands, because we don't tend to focus on them, and they are there, and they're there for a reason. So these are commands to separate, let's say. Titus 3, verse 10 to 11, warn a person once, warn him twice, and after that have nothing to do with them. 1 Corinthians 5, 11, do not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but lives in sin, who continues and continually lives in sin. Don't have anything to do with them. 1 Corinthians 5, 12 to 13, Judge those inside the church and expel the wicked person from among you. Do we talk about that much? Do, is that part of our, our thinking when we've been hurt? Does that come into play? Well, the, it comes into play in Scripture. There's a time for that. The hard part is to know when that time is. <laughs> That's really hard. But we are to judge those inside the church. We're commanded to do so, and then we're, we're to expel the wicked person from among us. 1 Timothy 5.20, reprove leaders before everyone, that means publicly, so that the others may take warning. So there should be reproving, there should be confrontation, which some of us are comfortable with and some of us are not and that's also a cultural thing and Nepal confrontation is very open and it's very physical <laughs> we tend to hide our feelings we tend to hide our hurts anyways reprove a leader before everyone third third John 1 verse 9 to 10 Diotrephes loves to be first when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing. So what John is saying is Diotrephes is doing wrong. I'm going to tell everyone about it. I'm going to confront him publicly. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. Terrible times are coming. People will be selfish, and yet they will have a form of godliness, have nothing to do with such people. So terrible times are coming, have nothing to do with people that act godly, but, they're, but they are not. Ephesians 5.11, expose fruitless deeds of darkness. 2 John 1.10-11, do not welcome anyone in your home that does not hold on to true teaching, and if you do, you will partner in their wickedness. What John is saying here is if there's a false teacher and you give your money to him, and you accept him in your home, you're taking part of his wicked deeds. Wow, that is really, really hard. This is hard stuff. 
in one way, it's easier to ignore all our pain, all our hurt, and say, oh, whatever, I forgive, I'll pray for them. That's an easy way out. But is it the right way out? Is it the godly way out? Is it the loving way out? There are all kinds of commands telling us to confront and to expose and to talk about what is wrong so that we can learn. None of it's done out of hate, by the way. Revelation 2, verse 2. Well done, you Ephesian church, for not tolerating wicked people and testing those who claim to be apostles but are not. Well done, church, because you're tested, your leaders, and you had nothing to do with those who are wicked. Revelation 2.20 I have this against you, Theatira Church. You tolerate this woman, Jezebel. Why do you tolerate her? She's hurting you. She's leading you into wrong teaching. Why have you not kicked her out? Is it possible that the reason is we think that we should accept everything and pray for our enemies? That we allow these people to keep on hurting the church continually? That's a possibility. Philippians 3.2, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Those are harsh words in the Bible. So you see, there's, there's different ways of reacting. When you're hurt by someone, there's going to have to be a lot of wisdom. There's going to be a lot of self-seeking and saying, okay, what is the cause here? What's going on in my life? Is it me? Is it them? Why is it? What is it? There is going to have to be confrontation. Now, confrontation is a harsh word. This doesn't have to be confront confrontation right away. There's going to have to be conversation. There's going to have to be, hey, this is hurtful. I think this is wrong. Why is this being done? That has to happen. Or there will never be the second step which says, okay, You've tried your best, have nothing to do with them. And that is perfectly biblical and perfectly loving for the sake of the church. You see, sometimes we have to confront false teachers for the sake of other believers because they are also being hurt. Uh, when we are hurt, it's very possible that other people are being hurt. And so the loving thing to do is, is try to deal with it. First of all, we try to work it out. But if it doesn't work out, there can be separation. So what do we do when we're hurt? First of all, we have this context where, look, it's a mess. <laughs> it can be me. It can be them. It can be false teachers. It can be demonic. It can be all kinds of these things. First of all, understand that it's not always forgive and forget. It should always be confront. It should always be deal with it, talk about it. And then there's all kinds of steps you can take after that. Um, one step you can take after that is say, look, we do not see eye to eye. Let's part ways. You're my brother in Christ, but we don't. We, we, we can't work together because of our abuse. And that happened in the New Testament, and that can happen again. Another thing is, look, you are speaking wrongly. You are, you are preaching a wrong gospel. I, I will have nothing to do with you. That is also a perfectly biblical step. And it's protective. It's protecting our families. It's protecting those who we have influence over. And it's perfectly biblical. And obviously, obviously there's also the possibility of, of, of working things out. Right? But we're talking about the time we've been really hurt. Um, when, you, when you choose to talk with someone, you can start to understand each other's point of view. And th there are things, like I said, that are just cultural. They just happen to be our own perspectives. There's all kinds of things that we can work out. Why, why do we confront? Why do we have to speak out when we're hurt? Because we care. Because we care. Because we care for the person who hurt us and because we care for the people around us. We have to care. We have to love. There is a possibility of those people turning and changing. There is a possibility of me changing because I was the one who was weak and I was the one who was hurt. 
if I speak out, if I do not speak out, no one will ever change. I won't change, someone else won't change. So there, there has to be speaking out. Matthew 5, verse 23 to 24. It basically tells us to speak out. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. So if you are hurt, yeah, the first step absolutely is to talk about it and figure out what's going on. And in this case, verse 24, there's reconciliation, but that's not always the case. Obviously, uh, Titus or chapter 3, verse 10 to 11, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time and after that have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such a person is warped and sinful and they are self-condemned. So there are people in the church, and there might be people in the church who are constantly causing trouble, constantly bringing things up that are hurtful, and you might not be the only person that's hurt, and that, that's a good reason for you to speak up and say, look, this, what you are talking about, what you're saying, is hurting people, and you need to stop. And if it doesn't stop, you need to bring other people with you and talk about it. And if not, it says here, have nothing to do with them. Have nothing to do with them. That is also a biblical step to have nothing to do with someone who calls himself a Christian. There are those people, and we need to be ready to do that. We just need God's wisdom, really. We really, really need God's wisdom on this. Ephesians 5, verse 8 to 14. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what is dis the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. There's shameful things that happen sometimes in the church that the church covers up because it's shameful. But here it says, no, no, expose it. Expose it for the benefit of everybody. It's a learning thing. Yes, it's shameful. Yes, it's hurtful. Yes, it's embarrassing. But if you don't expose it, you're taking part of the darkness. And you want to make sure that you say, hey, no, I have nothing to do with that darkness. Or if you're the darkness, you need to repent, right? But you need to bring it to light. You need to bring things to light. So when you're hurt by the church, There's a tendency to think that you should not speak up. You should not cause ripples. You should not cause troubles. But if you've prayed about it, if you know that you, you, you're not hateful and you're loving and you know that there's something deeply wrong there, there is nothing wrong with exposing it. Or else you're playing a part in hiding something dark and other people may fall into it. So expose it, it says. Um, I'll go back to 1 Timothy 5.20. But those elders who are sinning among you, you are to reprove before everybody so that the others may take warning, especially when it has to do with leadership. There has to be re rep reproving among everybody. Everybody needs to see it, understand it, so that they will not be trapped by it. it it's for the sake of others. And I love Romans 12, 18. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So there's all these verses that says, absolutely, you have to be united. And there's some that say, no, be separate. And there's some that say, well, try, try. What I'm trying to say is there's all kinds of godly ways to deal with things. It depends on the situation. But we have to know about these, these ways. We have to understand these things. Always, always talk to people when you've been hurt because that's the only way you will grow. It's the only way others will grow. And it's the only way we will be protected as a church. But when you do it, always take the log out of your own eye before you do it, right? Matthew 7, 1 to 6. Always look at yourself first. 
Jesus said, like, you know, before you try to take the dust out of someone else's eye, look at yourself first, and then you'll have the humility to be able to help others. So, yes, always look at yourself first. I want you to understand that we do not have to let ourselves be under anybody except for Christ. L listen to what Paul says to the Galatian church in chapter 5, verse 1 to 3. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 to 3. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Now, Paul is talking about a false teacher that came into the church who was teaching the church to, to trust in the law again. He was talking about salvation by grace, but then he was saying, oh, but by the way, salvation by grace, but you have to be circumcised, and you have to read your Bible every day, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. And Paul is saying, you are allowing yourself to be under a yoke of slavery. This is your fault. This is up to you. You are not bound by anybody to stay under false leadership. You are per perfectly free to leave. For the sake of Christ, we submit, and for the sake of Christ, we can leave. We are free to do either or. Um, listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, this is the important part here in verse 19 and 20. You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or puts an air or slaps you in the face. You see, Paul was saying, look, why do you put up with such leadership that is overbearing? Why are you putting up with people that are using you, that are hurting you, that are enslaving you, that are exploiting you, that are taking advantage of you and are slapping you in the face? Why are you doing that? It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Why do you put up with such things? You don't have to. And sometimes I think that people think that we have to. We have to stay in that situation. We have to stay in that abusive situation where we're being hurt over and over again by the Christians that surround us. No, we do not have to. But the loving thing is, is to speak up and say, look, this is wrong, guys. This is wrong. Let's stop doing this. It's hurtful. It's not, it's not good. And if they don't accept it, goodbye. Goodbye. I am moving on. That is a perfectly biblical thing to do. You see, 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14 says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. It's for the sake of the Lord that we submit ourselves to a church. And it can also be for the sake of the Lord that we separate ourselves from a church. Expect to be hurt more. I'm sorry to say, expect to be hurt more. This is absolutely biblical. The Bible prophesies it over and over again that as we get closer to the end times, this world is going to become horrible and the church is going to become horrible and we are going to fight and hurt each other. And so you need to expect more hurt and be ready for it. How can you be ready for it? You see, a false leader will put himself on top of the chain and he wants you to hold on to him and the next person holds on to you and you're kind of like a chain holding on. You have your denomination up here. You have your church. You have your pastor. You have your family. You have your parents. It doesn't matter who it is. Do not hold on to anybody up here because if they crack, you crack. If they sin, your faith will suffer. The, the biblical way of, of, of a church is not holding on to a leader at the top. It's like a bicycle tire where the hub is God, and each spoke is directly connected to God. We hold on to Christ alone, not our denomination, not our church, not our family. 
nobody, but we do help each other. See, the spokes in between the spokes, we're pushing and pulling each other. We're praying for each other. We're encouraging each other. But if someone cracks away, no problem. We're still connected to the hub. And that is what is going to keep us safe in the end time. I got so much verses here. 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 2. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceptive spirits. But here's the verse that's been on my heart. And this is what I will close with. Matthew 24, 9 to 13. Th this is just, oh, it's just so important. Matthew 24, 9 to 13. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith. Many, please notice, many people will turn away from God. And they will betray and hate each other. So Christians will turn away from Christ and they will betray you. And they will hate you. They will hurt you. Be ready for it. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And here's the important verse that is on my heart, verse 12. Because of the increase in wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Do not let your love grow cold. Don't let it. Don't Be ready that you are going to walk in to a lot of hurt in the, in the days to come. As we approach, I don't know when the end times comes, but I do know we're getting there faster than we were a few years back. And I do know that as we get closer to that time, things are going to get really nasty. And we need to hang on to Christ. And we need to hang on to love. We do not let our love grow cold. We need to stand firm and we can be saved. So this, this subject requires many, many, many weeks because each, each thing needs to be dealt with separately you know, how all these things. But I'm trying to, to paint a picture for you and say, look, it's not always just bare under it. That's not always the right way to deal with things. And also be understand that this type of problem is going to be more and more common. And just do not let it hurt you to the point where you just say, forget it all. Don't Don't get to that point. Just hang on to God. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word and, and you have prophesied and Peter has prophesied and Paul has prophesied over and over that in the end times, there's going to be terrible times coming and, and there's going to be wicked people and, and we're going to, there's going to be so much problems and there's going to be false teachers and God, we cannot stand on our own. And God, I pray that if we are hanging on to the teaching of so-and-so, that, that you would show that to us so that we can no longer hang on to the teaching of so-and-so, but we can hang on to your truth and that we would follow you and that we would hold on to you only in these last days and stand firm. I ask for those um, who have been hurt and, and I pray, God, that you would help them to understand why they were hurt. If it is false teaching, if it is them, if it is their sin, if it's other sin, or what it is, I pray that you give wisdom to us and just give us strength and courage to deal with it and to speak up and to stand for truth and expose darkness. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.